Hi everyone, Brett McGee Quilts here with another Sew With Me video. Today I'm working on the edge of this quilt. I had someone in the comments asking about how I finish my edges because I brought it up in my basting video. Uh, and when I say edge, I mean my binding of my quilts that I'm, of the, this particular series of quilts. Get my knot going here. If you look here, you can see I've turned in all the edges around the perimeter of this quilt, which uh, is not a usual way. Usually you've got your unfinished edges and then you sew a binding to your quilt, flip it over, sew it to the back. Uh, people do hand, people do machine, people do all kinds of binding that way. And usually it's an added piece. This it's all included in one. If you look on the back, you can see I've got about an inch of seam allowance inside the quilt. So you can see that from the back, which I don't know, I don't mind, it's, it's the back and this is a piece meant to be hung on a wall. So it's fine, you know, the back of a painting isn't always the most beautiful thing you've ever seen in your life. So I'm gonna start here, that way I can show you going around this edge. And it's pretty simple, it's just a million, <laughs> what seems like a million blanket stitches going all the way around. And I'm gonna make sure that tail and knot are inside as I go around. And what's cool about this method is that I do have tails and, and spots that are uneven, you'll see as I go along. And I can just tuck them all in and make it look nice as I go along. So bring that needle back through the hoop. And my stitches are, you know, an eighth of an inch, sixteenth of an inch, somewhere in there apart. So you just take a stitch and then I like to pull it all the way until I've come to here and then pull the needle back through that little loop and it gives you the blanket stitch. And I like this because it gives the quilt, you know, this is a hand stitched quilt in every single stage. No machine has been used. So I like the binding to kind of reflect that. And this, I find that these little tiny blanket stitches are just one more element of hand stitching that is very, very evident. You know, sometimes with a hand stitch binding, it, it isn't so obvious. Or with a backing, you don't see it there in the back. You know, or excuse me, a facing. If you do a facing that you've taken your binding and pulled it all the way in the back, you don't see it. So this is a way of just kind of acknowledging the hand stitch element of the quilt for a binding. Anyway, today I thought I would do a little story time and talk about growing up and my relationship with the ocean and water and, and all of that. All my quilts, it seems, have a kind of connection to the ocean or to water or something natural, but mainly it's these ocean themes that I, I'm, I keep coming back to and probably always will. It's, it's like a natural impulse. Like so many kids, you know, I was born in 1981 and The Little Mermaid came out when? 1987, 88, 89? somewhere in there and it really changed my life. It sounds cheesy to say, but uh, you know, as a kid, it really captured my imagination. I watched it over and over and over again. 
And I don't think it was so much the story I was interested in as the setting. So like so many kids, I was like, well, I'm going to be a marine biologist when I grow up. Um, everything became about that. And it ended up manifesting in interesting ways. Like my dad had the idea that may, that we should do aquariums. We should get started with aquariums. And so we would go to, we were a military family. And so we'd go down to the, uh, you know, not the BX, but the other, you know, where the, where you could go shopping on base. And there was like a Sears there or kind of an all purpose store. And they had a pet section that had, um, you couldn't buy the fish there, but you could buy the supplies. And so we got, you know, a 10 gallon aquarium and all the, the filters and the air pumps and plant, you know, plastic plants and all the things that you would put into an aquarium in the early 90s. Um, and, uh, you know, that was something we did together. And then we would go to the the fish the fish store and pick out fish and literally I did that all the way through high school I used to frequent the local fish store uh which was just a few blocks away from where I lived and I would you know it was a it was like someone took a house and turned it into uh, an aquarium store and there was a freshwater room and then a whole room with salt water and man I just I'll never forget we had the, the we had the aquarium set up and i told my dad that the last time we were in the fish store i saw a fish that i really really wanted to put in our tank and so the next time we went cuz it was time to set up the aquarium and put the fish in you know or, or the aquarium had been set up and now it was time to put the fish in and so we went to the store and i pointed out the one i wanted which was this bright electric blue fish and my dad said, well, we can't get that fish because it's salt water and we have a freshwater tank. And that's when I learned the difference. It was in that moment that I couldn't have that blue damsel fish in my tank because it needed to be a saltwater aquarium. And so then I was just sort of, I mean, it was still cool, but I, I set my sights on that saltwater aquarium. And in the, in the coming years, I, I did have saltwater aquariums of various size and uh, complexity when it came to the systems. And I don't know, listen, keeping an aquarium is, it's a lot more work than you might think. And you've got to be someone who really has, ha you know, you have to be uh, diligent with it. And, you know, I am diligent when it comes to the stitching, but with the aquariums, it was a whole other ball of wax. So maybe I wasn't the best aquarist. Uh, and I had my ups and downs, and sad to say, so did my animals. Um. <laughs> May they rest in peace. Uh, it's a difficult hobby, and now, you know, the hobby has come a long way. Before, they just had to go out in the ocean and take everything, but now they're doing a lot more aquaculture to prevent having to go out and take things from the ocean. Um. So that's good. I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure how necessary the aquarium hobby is, although now that you know the ocean is heating up by the the day, and those warm temperatures really really affect uh, habitats which are meant to stay at a very stable temperature, and we think of uh, coral reefs as tropical, but those waters are often deeper than you think and cooler than you think. And they really do need to stay at a certain degree. And since we are having coral die off and diversity die off, um, the aquarium industry might be helping to preserve some of these species. But I digress. Anyway, so I always had um, the ocean on my mind. Anyway, my dad and I... We would take trips every summer, just the two of us, and we had a cab over camper. You know, one of those campers that fits over the cab of a truck. And we would go to places like Yellowstone and 
we'd go fishing. Well, one year we went all the way out to Seattle where I eventually ended up living for 11 years. And it was because of that trip. I just fell in love with the area. It, it's so beautiful there. You, you have the Puget Sound, you know, the city is right there on the Puget Sound. And then off in the distance, when you look out over the Puget Sound, you see the beautiful um, Olympic Peninsula, the mountains over there. And just beyond that is the ocean. And so we did all of that. We went out to the ocean and as we walked on the beach, you know, I was just a kid. Uh, there were like these fish that pop out of the sand. You know, it was like a tidal zone. And there was some, you know, piece of driftwood with algae growing on it. Well, at that point, I had a saltwater aquarium set up. So I was like, we're bringing this home. And I'm going to put this in my tank. You know, we're going to put it in our cooler. And it, I did, <laughs> I did put that in. And that piece of the seaweed lasted longer than you might think, algae in my, in my tank. Here you're noticing, if you can see, I've got a little bit of this white peeking through, which is fine, but I'm gonna try to now be kind of adjusting it as I go, tucking it in. Focusing so much on telling the story, I'm doing a terrible job with my stitching. But what I remember most about that trip is coming to the sea and just being confronted by the size of it, um, the smell, and just feeling like, man, this is it. I grew up in South Dakota. So that's the other part of this you should know. And South Dakota is as far away from the sea as you can get. Um, I mean, literally, think about it. It's smack dab in the middle of the continent in every way possible. And so it's, uh, it's very far. But there is something boundless and huge about South Dakota that has an ocean-like quality, particularly where I grew up. I grew up in the Black Hills, which is this beautiful hill forested hills that are smack dab in the middle of the great plains which themselves feel like an ocean i've often said when you go out there you feel it's almost like going to hawaii or someplace it's like a, an island of forest in the middle of this great plains so i don't know maybe i was attuned more attuned to that feeling of vastness to that ocean-like feeling than I know being in South Dakota. But when I was younger, even younger than this trip to Seattle, my family, which is a family of five, mom, dad, and my two older sisters, I was the baby. We would take these epic family road trips. My family has a bunch of relatives down in Florida. That's where my parents grew up, Cocoa Beach. And so we would, we took that same cab over camper all the way down from South Dakota to southern Florida all the way down to Key West in that cab over camper where, you know, this was the height of my Little Mermaid obsession. And uh, jumping into those waters and seeing the fish just right off the dock in the water was so magical for me. I had a Little Mermaid coloring book and we would have coloring contests that's how we kept ourselves occupied on these long drives. I mean, I would never win, of course. My sisters, who are five and six years older than me, would win with their Precious Moments coloring books. If you remember Precious Moments. But that Little Mermaid coloring book, you know, it meant a lot to me. It was like I could immerse myself in that environment just by making art. Sure, it was just coloring, but I got to be in that environment. I got to be interacting with that environment. And so just that whole area of really Key West with its nautical feel and knowing that there were, you know, just out of reach coral reefs 
in that area, which by the way, now are being completely devastated by the change in temperature going on. Florida is like a hot tub right now down in those waters. Um, and I, you know, I'd like to say that I could do something to help, but other than voting, I guess, you know, there's this word awareness, bringing awareness, um, but awareness to who? The corporations who don't give a damn, uh, the politicians who um, use use it as a wedge issue to get elected to do the bidding of the corporations who don't give a damn. I don't know. It it it, it feels so bleak. So I make art, and that's what I do. Um, anyway, <laughs> so that's Florida. Uh, that's Florida. I'm coming around this corner here. And it's a good time to pivot to Alaska, <laughs> another place with a relationship to the ocean that I have a relationship to the ocean with. Let me just shut up while I go around this corner. Now here you can see these tucked in edges. And what's so cool about this is all of this is just gonna get tucked in because I'm just gonna grab what I want to be seen. Here you can see going around that edge. It looks nice. All right, so Florida, or excuse me, Alaska. In that same cab over camper, all five of us in my family, we went up to Alaska. My dad was uh, very interested in Alaska. He liked fishing and and things like, and road trips. He still likes to drive. Uh, and so we packed up, again, from South Dakota. We went all the way up to Seward, Alaska, and Anchorage, and various places. Um, there was a military base in Seward, Alaska. And since we were Air Force, you know, we could stay at, at, at various places just for the military, really, and take advantage of that for... For cheap and when we got up to Seward Alaska you know the whole Alaska trip was basically a bunch of glaciers and I'll tell you what we stopped at every single one my sisters and I I, I was probably I don't know uh, eight seven or eight years old um, my sister's five and six years older than me and you know when you're that age you've seen one glacier you've seen them all of course I'm sure they're all melting now um, but, you know, Alaska is just wild. It's fast and it, it's wild. So, I mean, we went to uh, McKinley. It was called McKinley at that time, Mount McKinley State Park. Now it's called Denali, I believe. You know, they changed it from a, 
a, an American president, a white American president, and renamed it for really the, the local people, the, the first peoples, the indigenous people there. So they renamed it Denali. And I think it was all, I think it was called N Denali National Park at the time, if I, if I recall, but you couldn't drive in. You had to get on a bus. You had to take a bus tour in. And so we got on this bus tour with God knows who else. And I had one of those disposable Kodak cameras. And as we were driving, the, the bus driver says, oh, if you look out the left side, you can see a, a big grizzly bear out there in the tundra. You know, at the time it was green and beautiful. And, uh, you know, everyone was going, wow, this bear was, you know, it was off in the distance, girl. It was far away. And I pulled out my little camera and I decided I was going to take a picture of that, that bear. And so I'm lining up my shot and all of this, trying to get a picture. I'm, I snapped a picture. And this man, this adult man says, oh, with that little camera, you're never going to get a picture of that bear. Now, he's holding this camera that's got a big lens on it, and you can tell he's serious about wanting to take pictures. But any person who's any good at something and who uh, doesn't have anything to prove is not going to be belittling a little kid just doing what any tourist, let alone a little kid, would be doing, which is trying to take a picture of the thing. And, you know, not really thinking about composition and telephoto lens and all of this. And I just never forgot that man basically pissing all over me in that moment. He wasn't kind. He wasn't going, you know, he wasn't he wasn't being supportive. He was being an a-hole. So this kind of just tells you, you got to be careful out there, folks. P kids remember and I've never forgotten that that man who was such a, you know, an idiot, an egotistical idiot trying to, you know, belittle a little kid. Anyway, the pictures got developed. And you know what? You could see the bear off in the distance. And even if it wasn't like some great picture of the bear, you could get the idea of the beautiful landscape. And the, I still remember it, these, you know, greens that almost look like these greens you see here. And these kinds of purples, uh, because there were flowers. It was like paradise. It was gorgeous. So that man can just, you know, I don't know. It, normally I would be cursing here, but I'm, I'm trying not to do that. So, so that was one event that happened. The other main thing that that is embedded into my memory from that trip was we were staying at this campground in Seward and it just the whole city the whole town just smelled of fish and the sea and my dad wanted to go deep sea fishing he wanted to you know do a, a tour get on a boat and uh, my sisters and my mom wanted nothing to do with that and so my dad took me for a day, and again, I was a very little kid. And, you know, I was a gay little kid, too. I was not interested in, quote-unquote, boy things, guy things. And fishing definitely fell into that category. But it was a boat, and it was the ocean. And, you know, my dad was bound and determined to, to go out and do this and so that we could have this memory together. which is very sweet. And so we got on this boat and there was maybe, I don't know, eight of us. It was all men except for one woman. And if I had to guess, she was 30-ish, late 20s, early 30s, um, pretty, um, sort of a blonde woman and... Uh, she had an Irish accent. I didn't know it was Irish at the time, but I now do. And she was very nice. And she was sort of kind of along for the ride like me. 
So we set off out to sea, and these Alaskan waters, there's a different feel to them. If you compare it to the last ocean I had been in, which was down in Florida, um, these waters were, first of all, freezing cold, even in the summer, and just a dark, menacing quality to them. The kind of seas where you're afraid of what's under that water more than you might be afraid down in Florida. You know, it's not the kind of water you want to jump in. It's the kind of water that you fear if you have thalassophobia. And so there was just this I, one I loved it. I still see that midnight blue tinged with seaweed kelpie green. And you would look down into the water and you couldn't see. It was like floating on... Uh, scary soup. <laughs> um, anyway, so the the guys all start. What's the term? Throwing lines, you know, putting their poles out into the water, and they were very nice. And my dad was like, "All right, well, this is going to be your line. This is your fishing pole." And you know, what you really do is you sort of set your pole up and you wait. And so this was mine. I wasn't holding my fishing pole. They knew better than to have me holding my fishing pole out in, out in those waters. Get, get pulled right over the edge. Anyway, my, the, my line starts, you know, I got something on my line. And so after a little struggle and some help from my dad and whoever else, they pull up a shark, a little shark, maybe three feet, if I recall correctly. And I was just like, oh my goodness, there is sharks in these waters. And of course the, the byline in the paper read, you know, <laughs> little kid hooks huge shark. You know, that's the story my dad told. You caught a shark in Alaska because, you know, you, you, you make kids feel good. Um, even then, though, I knew it was like, well, first of all, I didn't catch that. Someone else caught it. And it was just my, my pole in my fishing rod in name only. And we, I'm glad we put that shark back. Um, so it was like a whole thing. Anyway... As the day went on on this boat, I began to get seasick, nauseous, and quite frankly, homesick. I was the kind of kid who had a hard time even uh, staying the night at a friend's house without wanting to come home, without feeling very anxious. And so I started to feel very trapped on this boat and just not into it. And the, the nice the nice woman on the boat, I don't remember her name or anything about her other than she was pretty and kind of young and, and blonde hair. Um, she said, she took care of me. She, there was like sort of a little a cabin area on the boat and she took me there and she laid she she laid me down and she put my head in her lap and she was sort of stroking my hair and she started to you know she was trying to make me feel better um make me it, she was trying to comfort me and it was so sweet she didn't know me and you know my dad was trying to have a good time fishing with the guys and i'm sure she recognized that and um and so whatever maternal feminine instinct she had in that moment kicked in and she decided to take care of me. And as I'm sitting there with her, with my head in her lap, she starts singing a song with her Irish accent. And it was, uh, Mersey doze and dozy doze and little lambs it ivy, a kiddly divy too, wouldn't you? And she just kept repeating it, Mersey doze and dozy doze. And I was like, what is this magical leprechaun song she is singing? I, you know, the, 
the lyrics made no sense to me. They sound marzy does and dozy does and little lambsy divey. It was like strange words. And I was lulled. I did. I fell asleep. I was lulled to sleep by this sort of comforting siren <laughs> out on the, on, on the literally deep blue sea, deep, dark blue sea. You know, she kept me from throwing up every kid's biggest fear. It wasn't until later that I learned that that song was a popular song from way back in the day. And the lyrics were not funny words. They were real words. Mares eat oats and does eat oats and little lambs eat ivy. A kid will eat ivy too, wouldn't you? So, you know, years later as an adult, when I found out, oh my God, that magic song she sang was like <laughs> a pop song from way back when, uh, that was sort of cool. And, you know, that song was even hold, she was definitely not alive when that song was around, you know, she, so she, who knows who, how she learned it and who sang it to her. And then she was singing it to me anyway. So we get back to land and everybody was bringing their catch. And this is one of those things where you could take it directly on the dock to have your catch weighed and uh, filleted, butchered, whatever you want to call it. And then they'd pack it up and you take it with you or you, you know, they pack it up and you send it home. Um, I don't know what happened. I don't know if we caught, if my dad caught anything or anything like that. I don't know what happened with that, but it was a very memorable day. And like I said, all I really remember is the color of that sea and the vastness of it the shark and this nice lady who made me feel feel better in a in a scary moment out at sea so thank you to whoever she was for being such a nice person and recognizing that a little kid needed a little comforting in that moment So I'm coming to the end of my thread here, and I've, I've never really come up with a great way to tie these off, and so I just do another one right where it is, and then I bury, I do a similar that when I'm doing my applique or my quilting. So I just take it, bury the thread, and actually, just to make it a little more secure, I'm going to do a little knot here in my usual fashion. So those were just some thoughts about you know, where I think my obsession with the sea came from as a kid growing up in South Dakota. It was these experiences that, you know, my family gave me, and particularly my dad, that opened up my imagination. So thanks. Thanks, Dad. Here, have a look. So I'd like to thank you if you've made it all the way to this part of the video. Um, my little story time. Like and subscribe if you feel so inclined. And uh, we'll see you next time.